Welcome back. It's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Daniel Solomon. Uh, he's an associate physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases, uh, where I work, um, and he's an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is a fantastic teacher. He won one of the um, residency teaching prizes this year, so we're fortunate to have him speak about vaccines today. Thanks so much for the introduction, Sarah, and thanks for the invitation to speak about adult immunization today. Um, I just want to say up front, I'm not going to be talking about any COVID vaccines. I hope that if I'm invited back to speak next year, that will be like the major update we get to talk about. Um, but that is not the focus of today's talk. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Um, most of you probably know about the resource on the CDC website that is the vaccine immunization schedule for adults. I find it to be a very helpful resource in practice if you're trying to figure out who needs what vaccine when, um, or if you're looking at people with different conditions, hey, which vaccines does my patient need? If you start to look at it too long, though, it sort of starts to look like a word puzzle, and I commit to you that I'm not going to go line by line and tell you which vaccines your patients need. My goals for today are really to focus on the highest impact vaccines, and I'll do that by discussing some of the common curbsides or conundrums that we see in clinical practice. I'll try to review some of the data behind changes in recent vaccine, recent changes in vaccine guidelines, and then of course address some areas of controversy, and along the way I'll provide some general tips and principles. Before diving into some of the specific vaccines, I think it's important to name the elephant in the room. I love this cartoon. It's an elephant lying on a therapist's couch saying, hey, I'm right here. No one's acknowledging me. And I think that elephant for us is that not everyone believes that widespread vaccination is the way to go. Um, this is a, uh, a public service announcement from a small but vocal anti-vaccine group that says, love them, protect them, never inject them, learn the facts before you vax. So this should go without saying, but I'm going to go back to my disclosure slide and say that I am definitively pro-vaccination. Um, and I think it's important to talk a little bit about vaccine refusal and vaccine hesitancy as we set the stage for this talk. So I'll start with measles. Um, this is a case of measles in a young individual. You can see the classic rash. And in the lower frame, these are coplic spots. There was a vaccine for measles implemented in 1957, um, and the rate of measles dropped tremendously. In response to a couple of local outbreaks, um, the series went from one dose to two doses in 1989, and in 2000, measles was declared eliminated in the United States. And as an infectious disease doctor in 2020, I am proud to say I've never actually seen a case of the measles. But we all know how this story goes, right? So in 2019, in the United States, between January and November, we had more than 1,000 cases of measles. In Europe, there were almost 90,000 cases in the first half of the year. And in the Philippines, in just three months, there were more than 23,000 cases and more than 300 deaths from the measles. I like to think about vaccines as sort of like a dam holding back water. On the other side of the dam, the water's really still, and it's very easy to remember to, it's very easy to forget how much pressure is built up on the other side of the dam. But if you bring down the dam, or even if there's a crack in the dam, we're reminded how strong that pressure is. If you're interested in this, I'd strongly recommend reading this article that was published in the New Yorker last summer, specifically about the outbreak of measles last year and in communities where there were lower vaccination rates. Um, so take your time, read through it, but I'm going to give you a couple of excerpts here. Um, vaccines work both for individuals and for the general public. They are one of the great advances of modern times, and they do not cause autism. Vaccine, vaccination has been the victim of its own success. Eradication has afforded us the luxury of equivocation. People have forgotten how dangerous these diseases were, and in the absence of reminders have become complacent giving in to what one doctor called immunological amnesia, right? This is the water behind the dam. But an outbreak is a fine bracer. And then he closes by saying the virus we are fighting isn't so much measles as it is vaccine hesitancy and refusal. So who is it who's refusing vaccines? In a country where everything seems to divide along political lines, it's interesting to note that vaccine hesitancy and refusal actually does not fall along political lines. We see libertarians refusing vaccines, diehard liberals. We see people who are religious. We see secular groups. 
and it really spans the socioeconomic spectrum. So I, I say this because when we think about vaccine refusal, it's important to think about this as a heterogeneous group with different reasons. People refuse vaccines for different reasons. And when we think about the end goal, which is increasing the rate of vaccination across the population, we might need to think about different interventions for different populations. So what can we do about it in the clinic? Um, I have two small children and I feel like I fail in negotiations on a daily basis, but I have learned a couple of lessons that I, I, I wanna share with you that may be useful in your clinical practice. The first is to pick your battles. And what I mean by that is to invest in the vaccine hesitant group. So I actually think this is a useful paradigm that has really changed the way I think about vaccine hesitancy. It's not a binary thing. Yes, I want vaccines or no, I don't. People usually fall ac across this spectrum. And I would say, don't invest too much time in the people who come in ready for the vaccines. Just go ahead and give the vaccine. And on the flip side, there's some people, and you know them in your practice, who are never gonna get the vaccine no matter what you say. So while it's still are important to educate them and give up them our advice, maybe don't invest too much energy all the way over here. It's really this middle group that I think uh, is the opportunity to move the needle. And where people are along that spectrum, you might actually choose different interventions. So if someone's pretty much ready to get the flu shot, but they need a little bit more information, maybe it's just a bit more information. If someone's leaning away from it, but they're willing to hear more, maybe a strategy of motivational interviewing or other techniques to move them along this spectrum will be important. So as we think about you know, increasing vaccination rate, this, this paradigm of vaccine acceptance being a spectrum, I think is useful. What else can we do? So a united front, this is when my son says, can I have chocolate? I say no, and he goes to my wife. He says, can I have chocolate? It's important for us to be united. I think it's the same thing in a clinic setting that patients should be getting a consistent message across the board from when they check in with the administrative staff, when they get their vitals from the MA or the nurse, everyone should be giving a consistent message around the importance of vaccination. Two positive choices. So I like this one. My son likes to avoid taking a bath at night and I've learned not to say, hey, Jonah, are you going to take a bath? Because the answer is always no. So what I say is you're going to take a bath tonight. Do you wanna take it before dinner or after dinner? Um, so you could use this with the flu shot. You could say you're due for your flu shot today. Do you wanna get it at the beginning of the visit or the end? People can still opt out, but the default should be, this is our recommendation and um, we're gonna ask you to choose to get it now or later. And finally, I would recommend using stories instead of data. So data speaks to me for sure, but when patients are in the exam room and deciding whether or not they want a needle in their arm, sometimes it's the stories that resonate. People who got vaccine preventable diseases. I'm sure you have them in your own practice, but if you don't or don't wanna share those personal details, I wanna share this website. It's called shotbyshot.org. Um, and these are you know, really heart-wrenching stories of people who are affected by vaccine preventable diseases. Okay, so you might say, gosh, you know, I'm in the clinic day in and day out, and I feel like I'm not moving the needle. Is there anything I can do on a larger scale? And I would say, of course there is, um, and there are opportunities for advocacy. If we think about that, that, that paradigm of moving the needle, how can we make the biggest impact? I really think it's this advocacy for legislative change. Um, so it's gonna be laws that have strict um, policies about who is able to be exempt from vaccines that make the biggest difference. And I think this paper from the New England Journal really says it all. So this was a group that looked at the non-medical exemption rate, so religious exemption or philosophical exemption across different states. And then they sorted the states about by whether they had an easy exemption policy or a difficult exemption policy. And not surprisingly, the states with a difficult exemption policy had much lower rates of non-medical exemption. So this is actually the way to move the needle in the population um, by supporting you know, policy change at the higher levels. And if there's anyone in the audience logged in from Maine, I just wanna give your state a shout out. Last year, a new law was passed that barred residents from opting out of immunizations for religious or philosophical reasons. This came up for a vote in March and Mainers voted to uphold this law. Um, and I think this is the sort of intervention that we need in order to overall increase vaccine uptake. 
that's all I'm going to say for now about vaccine hesitancy or refusal. Um, I wanted to start with it because as we stare down the fall where we could have flu and COVID circulating simultaneously, I think there's a heightened importance on getting the flu vaccine this year in order to protect all of us. So thinking about ways we can, um, you know, in the clinic and outside the clinic, increase the rate of uptake, I think is important. Okay, let's dive into the specific vaccines. And we're gonna start with MMR. Um, and this is a uh, question that I'm gonna ask you um, to answer. This is audience response. So I'll read it. This is a common curbside or e-consult that I get. My patient was born in 1986. He's going to a new graduate program. So I checked a measles titer, which was negative. His immunization record shows that he had one dose of MMR in childhood. What would you advise this time, and I see people are starting to respond. I'll give you a few seconds to think through it. We're nicely over 100 votes here, so sorry if you haven't had a chance to vote, but I can tell that we're sort of split between A and B here. So let's dive into this. What counts as presumptive immunity? Um, so this is coming from the CDC. Any of the following counts as presumptive immunity for measles. Birth before 1957, laboratory confirmation of measles, and we're talking laboratory, not like I think I had measles in childhood. Verbal history doesn't count laboratory evidence of immunity, so that would be a positive serology, or written documentation of adequate vaccination. So what is adequate vaccination? That's gonna be the answer to our question. So as I mentioned earlier, in 1957, a one-dose series was implemented, and that results in a serial protection of about 93%. In response to a couple of local outbreaks, we moved from a one-dose to a two-dose series in 1989, and that results in a serial protection of about 97%. One dose is actually considered sufficient for most people, except for these three groups, healthcare personnel, so all of us, international travelers, or people attending college or other post high school institution. So if we go back to our question, um, our gentleman was going to a new graduate school, so one shot wasn't enough for him. He needs a booster shot. There is no need to check titers after that booster shot. Once you have adequate documentation of two shots in this individual, he is done. So I've been getting this a lot in the last year. People, patients come in asking for serologies and they sometimes come back negative. So what do we do with those negative serologies? And the answer is generally to ignore them. The sensitivity of the serology is only about 80%, and that number may be lower to detect vaccine-induced immunity. So people's antibodies, antibody titers boost higher when they have the actual disease than when they get the vaccine. So if you have age-appropriate vaccination, that would be one vaccine for most people or two vaccines for the three groups that I listed before, the um, age-appropriate vaccination documentation actually supersedes or trumps post-vaccination titers. So if I've had two vaccines and my titer is negative, I do not need a booster. My antibodies will boost in response to being exposed to the virus. Okay, that's all about MMR. Let's move on to influenza. So here's another um, audience response question. Um, you can read through the choices. I'm actually not gonna make you respond to it this time, but this is a 64 year old man who has no past medical history and he comes to your office requesting the high dose flu vaccine. He said his friends are getting it and they say it's all the rage. Here's a question, what vaccine can he receive? And we have um, uh, five choices here, the standard dose quadrivalent, the high dose trivalent, the adjuvanted trivalent, the recombinant quadrivalent, or the live attenuated vaccine. And if you're anything like me, I thought I knew what vaccines were out there, but all of a sudden there are more choices that I really know how to deal with. Um, so let's actually take some time and go through the flu vaccine because there are a lot of choices. I'm gonna give a lot of details about what choices are out there. I'm gonna say this now and I'll say it at the end. 
the specific choice of vaccine is actually much less important than someone just getting the flu vaccine. But it's important for us to know what's out there. So there are two types of vaccines. There, a flu vaccine, there's a trivalent and a quadrivalent. The trivalent has three strains of influenza, two influenza A strains, H1N1 and H3N2, and one influenza B strain. So that's three strains that makes it trivalent. Which vaccines are available? Um, we have the standard dose. And then here, what, here's what the letters mean. II, inactivated influenza vaccine three. That means that it's trivalent. That's indicated for anyone five years or older. There's the high dose flu vaccine. That's II, inactivated influenza vaccine, trivalent high dose for anyone 65 or older, or the adjuvant vaccine, similar, gives a more, more of a boost of the immune system. And that's only available for people that are 65 and older. Then there's the quadrivalent vaccine. We see the same three strains that are in the trivalent vaccine, plus one second influenza B strain. Which vaccines are available in the quadrivalent formulation? We have the standard dose, IIV4, that four is for quadrivalent. The live attenuated vaccine, this is the one that's given intranasally, that's approved for anyone between age two and 49. And then we have two vaccines that, are, that do not use eggs in order to create them, the recombinant vaccine or the cell culture vaccine. So those are the ones that are available. And if we want to answer the question for our 64-year-old gentleman, what is he able to receive? It's really a question about um, his age. So let's talk about the high-dose flu vaccine. The high-dose flu vaccine has four times the amount of antigen. And in serologic studies, we know that that results in an increased immune response. Antibody titers go higher when you are exposed to more antigen. But the really important piece is that it actually results in lower morbidity or fewer cases of influenza, decreased flu-like illness. This was a study published in the New England Journal in 2014 of 32,000 individuals greater than 65. And they looked at what percentage of them came in with flu-like illness. For people who got the standard dose vaccine, 1.9% came in. For people who got the high dose vaccine, 1.4% of people came in. And that difference was statistically significant. So on the individual basis, there's not much of a difference. Um, but if you sort of span that out over many million people over the age of 65, it can result in decreased influenza on a population scale. So the high dose trivalent vaccine was approved for use in patients older than 65. Because that difference on the individual scale is small, the advisory committee, ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, has no preference for standard dose or high dose, um, and it's going to be a shared decision with the patient. So if we come back to our patient, he's 64 years old. So he's not ready for the high dose or the adjuvanted vaccine, and he's too old for the live vaccine. So he can get the standard dose quadrivalent vaccine or the recombinant vaccine. And part of this will be what's available to you in your local practice. Here's an update for you. I get a lot of questions like, is the standard dose quadrivalent vaccine better or the high dose trivalent vaccine? The high dose is a little bit more immunogenic, but it only has three strains. Now we don't need to worry about that. In November of last year, the FDA approved the high-dose quadrivalent vaccine for adults older, older than 65, and hopefully that will be available this year. So if we want to keep it simple, here's what I would recommend. For anyone between 18 and 64, just go with the standard quadrivalent vaccine. For anyone 65 or older, I do lean towards the high-dose, and now that it's available in quadrivalent formulation, that will be a good choice for our older individuals. All right, let's stay with the flu vaccine for a few minutes. I think this is an important question. Your next patient is a 28-year-old woman who is eight weeks pregnant. She heard on NPR last week or last year that the flu vaccine is associated with increased risk of miscarriage, and she wants your guidance. What do you recommend for your pregnant women? Should we avoid the flu vaccine, wait until the second trimester, wait until the third trimester, or just give the vaccine now and assume we're you know, around the time where we should be giving the vaccine in an otherwise healthy individual? All right, we're over 100 responses, and I love this sort of overwhelming 
um, consensus that we want to recommend the vaccine now, and that is the correct answer. But let's look into this data a little bit. So flu vaccine during pregnancy, this sort of hit the, high, the, the headlines in 2017 when a study came out that sing, signaled an association between flu vaccine and miscarriage in women who were in their first trimester of pregnancy. It looked at women um, who got the flu vaccine the year before, and it turned out the women in that observational cohort who got the, the vaccine the year before and then got the vaccine had an increased rate of miscarriage in the 28 days after getting the vaccine this year. So this was problematic. We keep teaching, it's safe, it's safe. And we also know that flu um, can have severe complications in pregnant women. So, you know, that risk benefit of very, very small risk of miscarriage versus actually getting the flu in pregnancy turned out to be sort of complicated. Well, here's the good news. Um, and this is an update for you since last year. Um, a subsequent analysis of the years after that publication was, um, after the, the previous study showed that included more than three times as many participants showed no association between influenza and spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. So based on these findings, um, we know that it is safe to give the influenza vaccine in early pregnancy. And this is a very, very important population to be vaccinating because influenza in pregnant women can have complications for both mom and baby. So I'm glad that that sort of hiccup of a study actually didn't bear out um, in subsequent analyses. And just as you guys all voted, I would say we would recommend the vaccine now. It's really important to get our pregnant women vaccinated. Before we leave the flu vaccine, um, I think it's super important. I get a ton of questions every, every year. So let's do a little bit of a rapid fire question and answer. When is the best time in the year to vaccinate for the flu? Well, so there's good studies that show that antibody titers rise and peak about two to four weeks after the vaccine is given, and then they tend to wane over the course of the season. So if people get the vaccine on August 1st, they might have a peak of antibodies in early September, and then they might wane over the course of the season. So if possible, it's better to get the vaccine a little bit closer to flu season to match up the highest antibody titer with when you're at highest risk for getting the disease. And I would usually recommend sometime in October would be a good chance. So for patients who are reliable, you know they're gonna come back or for patients that you see every month, this is easy, you sort of say, let's do it in October. For patients who you see once a year, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait until October. I would say, you know, uh, although it may be better to wait a couple of months, let's not miss the opportunity to give you the vaccine because just getting the vaccine is the most important thing. Okay, so if antibody titers wane later in the season, is there any role for revaccination later in flu season? I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at this, and there's no recommendation at this point to give anyone a, a revaccination late in flu season in order to boost antibody titers, and we do not recommend that. What about someone who did not get the vaccine? and then they get the flu, should they get the flu vaccine after they've recovered? And the answer is yes. So as you know, there are multiple different strains of influenza that circulate each year. If we get infected with one, we do not necessarily get cross immunity to the other strains. So it's important to vaccinate individuals even if they did already have the flu in a given year. For individuals who are traveling to the Southern Hemisphere, remember that their flu season is opposite from ours. So this should be part of a pre-travel vaccination in someone who's going to Australia in June or July, for example. You should, maybe not this year, but in, in subsequent years, think about uh, giving the flu vaccine you know, over the summer if people are going to the su Southern Hemisphere. And then I get this question a lot, do statins decrease the efficacy of the flu vaccine? And the answer is actually maybe. Um, there, was a, there have been a couple of studies in people who are on statins that show a blunted antibody response. And the question is, what do we do with that data? I certainly don't, we don't know if that's clinically meaningful and we certainly do not recommend that people hold their statin when they get the flu shot. But I think it's an interesting finding. And for those individuals who are over 65, and are on a statin, it's another sort of reason for me to say, maybe we should go ahead and give you the high dose flu vaccine to optimize your vaccine response. So I think it's an interesting finding. I wouldn't do anything with it in clinical practice for now. All right, let's keep moving on. So um, the next vaccine I wanna talk about is, is tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. 
Um, and I'll push this out to the audience again. You have a 67 year old man who had his last tetanus shot 10 years ago. He doesn't remember if it was the TD or TDAP. What are you gonna give him today as a booster? We give him TDAP now and TDAP in 10 years, TD today and TD in 10 years, or TDAP now and then TD in 10 years. All right, so we're well over 100 votes. And it looks like we're sort of split. Most people going for C, but some people are gonna be um, going with A. And this is an update that I'm delighted to share with you. Okay, so um, adults, this is not the update. Adults need to receive one Tdap. Everyone knows that. And if you're not sure if your patient has had the Tdap, we always start with the Tdap. Historically, after that, adults would get a TD every 10 years. But in October of 2019, the CDC came out and said, you know what, we can just do Tdap for the booster. And I think that's easier and it has certainly changed my practice that when I'm boosting a vaccine, boosting the tetanus vaccine, I'm just using the Tdap now. In particular, the Tdap makes sense for people who are going to be around children, healthcare workers and college students to get that boosted immunity to pertussis. And in particular, pregnant women need to get the Tdap um, with every single pregnancy, even if those pregnancies are close together. And anyone traveling internationally really needs that pertussis component. So make sure that they get a Tdap every 10 years. So I find this a, a great update. I think it's useful. Now I'm just using Tdap for my booster. Um, TD is still okay. Um, so if you prefer to do TDAP now and then TD in 10 year, that's still accepted. Um, but I think it's probably simpler just to stick with TDAP. That's all I have to say about tetanus vaccine. Let's move on to something a little bit more complicated, which is the pneumonia vaccine. Um, so here's another audience response question. A 52 year old man presents, he has no significant past medical history, except for cigarette smoking. He smokes about half a pack per day and he comes to establish care with you. Does he need pneumococcal vaccination now? A, uh, no, let's just wait till he's 65. B, yep, let's give him Prevnar, that's PCV13, followed by Pneumovax, PPSV23, one year later. Or um, yes, he does, but he just needs Pneumovax now. And as you're voting here, um, I, I put the, the, the Rubik's Cube up here because I think the recommendations for pneumonia vaccination is, is, is truly a puzzle. Um, and I, I think it's actually hard to get your head around. So we have about 100 votes. We're split sort of between B and C. Let's see if I can simplify things as much as possible. So as you know, there are two different pneumonia vaccines. And moving forward, I'll just call them Prevnar, that's PCV13, and Pneumovax. PPSV23, so Pneumovax. And I'm gonna talk about each of them separately. And I think it's really useful to think about patients in three different risk categories. And I label them one, two, and three, because for the Pneumovax, that's the number of Pneumovax shots they get in a lifetime. So category one is our healthy non-smokers. That's category one, they're gonna get one shot at age 65, and then they are done. Category two is our patients with intermediate risk. So patients with lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, or anyone who smokes cigarettes, they're gonna need two vaccines in their lifetime. They need one when they present for care as an adult. So between the age of 19 and 64, and then a booster shot at age 65. So that's two vaccines. And then there's our highest risk group, group three. These are our immunocompromised folks. So patients with the HIV, anyone who's on a biologic or who's on chemotherapy, they're gonna get three shots. They're gonna get one when they present to care as an adult between the age of 19 and 64. They're gonna get a booster shot five years later, and then they're gonna get a third shot, a final booster shot at age 65. And here's a list of those uh, conditions that we consider to be immunocompromising. So if we come back, we have a, a, a gentleman who falls into category two, um, and he's going to need uh, Pneumovax as an adult at age 52, and then he'll need another one at age 65. 
Okay, so let's make things a bit more complicated. Um, we have a 65-year-old woman with no significant past medical history who comes in to establish care. What does she need for pneumococcal vaccination? Does she need the Prevnar now and then Pneumovax in a year? Or should, does she just need Pneumovax? Um, and I'll let you sort of mull on this question for a second, but you don't need to um, vote if you don't want to. In the interest of time, I'm going to move forward and say that there was an update last year, one year ago, from the ACIP and the CDC saying that the Prevnar for individuals age 65 and older is now a shared decision. So that's sort of annoying, right? Things got more complicated. It was easier when it was recommended that everyone gets Prevnar and then a year later they get Pneumovax. Now it's a shared decision with the patient, would you like to get Prevnar? Let's sort of think about the risks and benefits. So why did the ACIP make our lives harder? I wanna show you a little bit of this data. So this is a graph that I'll walk you through that shows the trend in invasive pneumococcal disease in older individuals, so people older than 65 over time. And if we go back to the late 90s and early 2000s, before the Prevnar vaccine was available, we saw that the baseline rate was about 60 or so cases of disease per 100,000 people. In 2000, the PCV7, that was the first formulation of Prevnar, was rolled out in, uh, this was in children. And when you vaccinate children, individuals older than 65 do better. We see a dramatic decline in the baseline rate to about 40. Then the Prevnar was updated to have 13 different strains, so PCV13 in 2010, and we saw another drop off in disease in individuals older than 65. So we went from about 40 cases per 100,000 to 25. In 2015, that's when the recommendation came down that Prevnar should be given to anyone older than 65. And in the subsequent several years, we saw no change in the rate of disease in that population. So because there was no significant benefit on a population scale, that's why ACIP said, well, it's hard for us to make a firm recommendation about it. So if we come back to Prevnar and look at those same categories, here's where we stand. In category one, healthy non-smokers, at age 65, you can make a shared decision. Um, in our category number two, it's the same thing. You can make a shared decision at age 65. It's the individuals who are immunocompromised who will always be recommended for Prevnar, and you give it once. Here's a clinical pearl for you. No one ever needs a booster of the Prevnar vaccine. Once they've had it, they've had it. And the second is that um, in people who do not have uh, immunocompromise, you give the Prevnar now and then Pneumovax in a year. For people who are immunocompromised, you really wanna get them vaccinated, so we give them Prevnar now and then Pneumovax in eight weeks. So if we come back to the case, um, either one is fine. It's a shared decision between you and your patient. What are we supposed to do with that? Well, um, you know, I think in practice, a lot of this will sort based on who the patients are. Um, you know your patients who are coming in to collect them all. They want everything, including a mammogram and a pap smear and a colonoscopy um, and all of the vaccines. Those people will probably opt to get the Prevnar. And the people who are a little bit more hesitant may say, I'm going to hold off on that one. What recommendations should we be giving? Well, in our healthy individuals, I actually don't have a strong recommendation because the data is not there. I would say I have a, I my practice is to give a little bit of a nudge or a recommendation to go ahead and get Prevnar in that category two. So the people with underlying diabetes, liver disease, lung disease, heart disease, anyone who's frail, it seems like you know the Prevnar may be beneficial in that group. Importantly, um, there are no vaccine safety concerns, so anyone who does want the Prevnar can get the Prevnar, um, and then it's going to be up to you and the patient to decide. All right, let's move forward. There are two more vaccines I want to talk about. The first one is HPV, and when I used to give this talk, I had to say, well, for, for, for girls we do this and for boys we do that. Um, the update, which I'll share with you, is that now boys and girls are treated the same way, which I think is the right way to go. All right, here's a case for you. You have a 26 year old man, he's healthy, he's sexually active with women and he presents to primary care. He's never been vaccinated for HPV. What are you gonna recommend? Are you gonna give the nine valent HPV vaccine? That's Gardasil, that's gonna be three doses. Are you gonna give him two doses of Gardasil? Or um, because he's 26 years old and he's a man um, and he's not MSM, uh, you don't need to give him the HPV vaccine at all.
So there's a mix of votes here, but people are leaning towards giving a three dose series. Um, and I'll show you some of the data for um, what we would recommend in practice. So in 2018, this is when the FDA approved expanded use of Gardasil to individuals older than age 26. So that was not our patient, um, but we used to stop at age 26. And now based on this data, we can give it to people up to age 45. Where does that data come from? It comes from a study of over 3000 women in that age group that showed that the vaccine is 88% effective. Only women were included in this group so the effectiveness in men is really inferred from this data, along with the proven immuno immunogenicity in general. So here's the, the change from last year. This was in 2019. The HPV vaccine is recommended for children and adults between ages 9 and 26. There's no difference between boys and girls, so treat everyone the same. And now it's a shared decision, so it's okay to give adults between the age of 27 and 45 the HPV vaccine, depending on what their interest is and what, your, what their perceived risk is for getting um, HPV. It is not licensed for anyone over the age of 45. So what does the vaccine series look like? I should have changed this age to nine because that's what the update is. But up through the age of 15, it's a two-dose series because children respond more robustly to vaccines in general. Over the age of 15, so 16 to 45, it's a three-dose series given at time zero, one month, and six months. As I said, it's recommended up to the age of 6, 26, and then anyone between 27 and 45, it's really a shared decision, and boys and girls, I'll say it again, are treated the same way. So let's go back to that shared decision because that puts um, you know, more work on us. Who should we be recommending the vaccine for? So I think it's most important for people who have not yet been sexually active, or maybe that they've had very few sexual partners, and for people who have, and or for people who have ongoing new sexual partners. So people who are out there ha having sex with multiple people will benefit from the HPV vaccine. For people who are in long-term, mutually monogamous relationships, um, it's gonna be less effective because the risk of exposure is much lower. One question I get a lot when I give this talk is, you know, are people going to have to pay out of pocket for this um, and or in, will insurance cover it? And the answer is that usually insurance companies will follow the recommendations of this advisory panel, the ACIP, but there may be a lag in that coverage. So it, the out of pocket cost is not trivial. It's somewhere between four to five hundred dollars. So what I have patients do if there's a question about this is they can call their insurance company to see if it would be covered. So if we come back here, our gentleman is 26. I'd give him the vaccine. It's recommended in this age group. All right, the last vaccine I'm going to talk about is hepatitis B. Um, and this is an e-consult that I get all the time. Um, this is a 24-year-old woman who works at a summer camp. She, during childhood, got the three-dose series of the hepatitis B vaccine, but her titer is non-reactive. What are you going to recommend? You say it doesn't matter, do nothing, you're not a healthcare worker. Would you restart the three shot series with the standard dose hepatitis B vaccine? Would you restart the series with Heplasav B? What is that? Or would you give one dose of the standard vaccine and then repeat the titers in four to eight weeks? And then if she's still negative, bring her back, rinse, and repeat. <clears throat> I like this. There's, there's like a nice Gaussian distribution of answers here. Um, and, and I think that that's actually the right distribution that we should look for because any of these answers is actually okay in practice. It's really gonna be based on patient preference and your preference. So let's dive into the specifics of the question a little bit. Now, as part of the hepatitis B elimination strategy in the United States, all children do get three doses of the hepatitis B vaccine in childhood. Most people do not need titers after vaccination. Who does need titers? So there are a couple of groups that I've listed here. Infants born to women who are hepatitis B surface antigen positive, healthcare professionals, anyone on hemodialysis, anyone who's immunocompromised, including HIV infected individuals, or anyone, any sex partner of a hepatitis B positive individual. These are the groups that we check titers on. Otherwise we shouldn't be checking titers. 
If you do check titers, make sure that you perform them one to two months after the last dose. That'll be the time when the antibody titers are higher. And if you want to revaccinate, you can provide a booster if they're not immune. Titers may wane over time, but usually boost with re-exposure. So if you've ever, ever had a positive hepatitis B titer, that counts. So maybe at age 21, I had a hep B titer that was you know, positive. At age 31, it's now negative. That's okay, my, my antibodies will boost if I'm ever re-exposed. So here's the update on hep B for you. This is Heplisav B. This is a new vaccine for hepatitis B that contains a novel immunostimulatory adjuvant that boosts the immune response. It's more immunogenic. It was approved by the FDA in 2017, and last year the ACIP included it as an option for hep B vaccination in adults older than age 18. So let's compare it to the standard dose. The standard dose is a three-dose schedule, so zero months, one month, and six months. Heplosav B is just two months, two doses separated by a month. The efficacy is higher, so in the standard dose, efficacy is 65 to 81%. Heplosav B is over 90% effective, and there's no significant difference in the side effects. The real question is whether this will be covered by insurance. As I said, when I spoke about HPV, usually insurance coverage follows the ACIP guidelines, but th this is another area where we wouldn't want patients being charged for the vaccine because it's on the newer end. So if we come back to our patient, she actually didn't need titers, so it would be reasonable to do nothing. So that's A. D would be reasonable as well if you wanna give her a booster and check titers, but I find that a little bit cumbersome. So if you choose to revaccinate, I would go ahead and give B or C, depending on what's locally available or what is covered by her insurance. Okay, here's a summary slide of all the updates that I gave you. So the high dose quadrivalent flu vaccine should be available this year. Flu vaccine is safe in pregnancy. Your tetanus booster can now be with Tdap, makes things easier. Prevnar in immunocompetent patients, this is shared decision-making. Um, Gardasil is now approved for both men and women through the age of 45, and Heplosav B is now available for Hep B vaccination for adults. I want to share with you on my last slide a couple of resources. So I showed you the vaccine schedule at the beginning, turn to it in clinical practice, but the best resource, the very best thing I'm going to leave you with is this website called Ask the Experts. It's arranged by vaccine with the most frequently asked questions for each vaccine, and the experts from the ACIP panel give nice data-driven answers to it. Whenever I have questions, that's where I turn. I think I have one minute remaining, so I'm going to pause there, uh, and Sarah, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks so much for that great review. There are so many questions, um, some of which I hope you covered. There were a lot of questions about um, the Prevnar vaccine and the polysaccharide vaccine, but I think you did a nice job of explaining the rationale behind why the recommendations changed. There is one, um, I'll, well, I think we have time for one question, and I'm gonna pick this one. Is high-dose flu vaccine recommended also for persons younger than 65 if they have a chronic condition which lowers immune response, for example, end-stage renal disease? Yeah, so it's such a great question. Right now, it is not recommended in anyone under 65, even if they're immunocompromised. I know that some people in clinical practice choose to give the high-dose flu vaccine for that very reason. That's gonna be sort of your decision based on your listening to my talk or reading the literature, but it is not approved for anyone under the age of 65 right now. All right, and hopefully we do have the Q&A session later, so hopefully we can get to some of these other questions, particularly if they're still lingering. Thank you so much for a great talk.